welcome back so today we will learn a surgical topic that is the pathophysiology of head injury we will learn some general points also but the main focus is also on we will uh, give upon the pathophysiological part of the head injury and that is a very serious and emergency condition in the surgical department so we have to learn this thing so let's learn some general points First, you will learn about the cerebral circulation. That is very important. We cannot compromise the blood flow towards the brain because we know that brain is sensitive to hypoxia. If uh, 10 seconds blood flow will stop, brain will die. So we have to take care of that. In this, the cerebral blood flow. It is mostly 750 ml per minute, which is 14% of cardiac output. Or we can say that 54 ml per 100 gram per minute. A very important and key point to note here, you must not be knowing this. The cerebral blood vessels are sensitive to pain. The condition which we see in the migraine is because of this this property the cerebral blood, uh, blood vessels and we know that we also learn about the brain is sensitive to hypoxia so we cannot compromise the blood, blood circulation towards the brain and the next point cerebral perfusion pressure the condition uh, how the blood flow is towards the brain the about the prognosis about the condition when the head injury is there we measure by cerebral perfusion pressure the cerebral perfusion pressure is supposed to mean arterial pressure minus intracranial tension this is the condition that is most important thing for the condition towards the blood brain. So now let us even learn about some the factors that are responsible for the regulation of cerebral blood flow towards the brain. So there are main uh, three important points. So let us learn about it. Next we will learn about the regulation of blood flow towards the brain. There are three main factors. Let us learn. The first most important point is the cerebral autoregulation. It is the most important property of the cerebral blood, blood flow. Uh, as this, in this, the cerebral blood flow is maintained in spite of altered cerebral perfusion pressure. This is a very important property that maintains the blood flow towards the brain. And this range for the cerebral blood flow auto regulation is 50 to 150 mm of energy for the cerebral perfusion pressure. Now next learn about the second important point which is CO2. How CO2 changes us? If the CO2 is increasing then it causes a Increase cerebral blood flow and if CO2 is decreasing then it causes the decrease cerebral blood flow. This property of change in the blood flow for because of CO2 we, uh, we apply in case of head injury by hyperventilating the patient. We see that we will learn about by hyperventilation there is decreased cerebral blood flow which causes the decreased intracranial tension. We will learn further in the pathophysiological part that is a very important property which we utilize for uh, treating the patients and that can save the life of the patient that is very important. And the third point is temperature. How temperature is this?
increasing temperature causes increase cerebral blood flow and decreasing temperature causes decrease cerebral blood flow this property also we utilize while in the surgical uh, surgery of the new, uh, of the head in the neurosurgery part how what the surgeon do is by decreasing the temperature or causing hypothermia they decrease the cerebral blood flow so that the metabolism and the intracranial tension can be decreased so that the blood do not spill out or there is no uh, hemorrhage part and hemorrhage condition in the while doing the surgery so that is very important property which you utilize in the neurosurgery part so now let's come learn about the pathophysiology of the head injury and how to take care of that next we will learn about the main pathophysiology part of the head injury so to learn that i have made very good uh, concept about it say there is a box which represents the cranial cavity that means the skull part inside which there are many things so the first thing is the main part that is the brain that is making the volume of 1400 ml now next we have the venous part and causing the internal organ of brain and the arterial supply and that takes the blood volume of 150 ml these all go arterial and venous part with the volume of 150 ml and surrounding that we have the CSF. That is causing the pressure towards the cranial cavity. We know that the cranial cavity, the skull, is the rigid part that is very hard and that cannot be broken. And the all thing will be putting the pressure inside uh, from inside towards the cranial cavity. So what we have to see is. and there is an internal uh, foramen that is known as foramen magnum only space from which the part is flowing brain spinal cord the circulation is there the thing uh, that cs of it is let's learn cs of means also the volume of 150 ml so what i have written here is there is a principle known as munro carey doctrine principle it states that the sum of all the factors present inside the cranial cavity is constant that means all these things that i have written here they are all constant and change in any one of these will alter the other parts also that means they will compromise the other part if we change in any one of these things inside the cranial cavity because it's a fixed it's a constant part so any of these thing one of these thing change the other will also change to compromise to maintain the sum to maintain the sum as constant so now let's learn about the main how this all happens so let's see, see first of all that we uh, we say that it is all thing is constant so let's say there is a head injury let's stop we start here and there is a head injury and there is rupture of any kind of vessel So that will cause the hemorrhage, and that hemorrhage will increase in all of the cranial cavity, and that will cause the increase in the pressure inside the cranium. That is known as intracranial tension, which is mostly 10 to 15 mm of Hg. This intracranial tension is constant for the brain. Why we are concerned about so much in the head injury part is because by increasing the intracranial tension they will compromise they will compress the brain part they will deform the brain and that will cause injury and we know that brain is the main center that is regulatory core of the body if that is compromised if that is compressed or deformed that will uh, decrease the function of the brain and that will cause a serious injury to the patient so we have to take care that 
intercranial tension is the main factor that should not be raised. If any of thing that raises the intercranial tension, we have to raise the tension and we have to take care in the surgery part that management is simple. We have to decrease the intercranial tension. This is the main, um, main treatment. How we do this, we will learn further. So, say if there is a hemorrhage that will cause the intercranial tension. So, now what happens is to maintain this principle, to maintain a constant part in all of these three factors, one of these things have to be changed. If one is saying, let's say, blood volume is increasing because there is a hemorrhage, so other factors have to be decreased so that that intercranial tension can be maintained positive by the body, um, maintained constant by the body. So let's learn how this um, in the flowchart form how this all things happens. So now let's learn about the pathophysiological part in the flowchart form that how, how all of those conditions are happening. So let's say there is a road traffic accident and the patient is stuck in his skull and there is an increase in the intercranial tension. There is a head injury, there is raised ICP. And then, so what the brain do is, what the finally the body is doing is to decrease the intercranial tension or to maintain that constant part, some of the component of all the three that we have learned, one have to be decreased so that the intercranial tension can be made constant. So, first of all, what the things do is, body do is, it decrease the CSF of volume. CSF is not much important for, for the brain part, not as compared to other arterial, it is not much important. So, first of all, the main component that will decrease is CSF of volume. It is via the foramen magnum. So, the CSF component will be decreased so that the intracranial tension can be maintained. So, say, like, the condition is not now according to whatever will. So the tension is still rising. The intercranial tension is still rising. So what the body do is next is it will decrease the venous volume. It's the second part. It will decrease the intravenous volume by the internal jugular vein. So that the intercranial tension can be made constant also. Say if it is not also happening, still there is a raising ICP. So what the body do is it will then cause the compromisation of the arterial blood flow. It is rather decreasing the cerebral perfusion pressure and that is very severe and dangerous condition for the brain. That is not going to compromise a lot for the brain. Say, if arterial was not working, by decreasing the arterial blood flow also there is an increase, still there is an increased intercranial tension. Now what can we do? That cranium is not, not the cranium cannot be broken. The once the cranium is broken, that means inside there is a very high pressure. So it is mostly done by surgeons, but normally body cannot do this. So what the body do is it will move out the brain. That is known as brain herniation. Note that point is very important. Brain herniation. It is because to decrease the tension inside the cranium. So brain do this. It will herniate out by the foramen magnum because it's the only space. Mostly it is two to three centimeter. Only large space in the cranium where from where the things can be go out and inside. That is the two to three centimeter foramen magnum. And see, it is only two to three centimeter, so much small. How will the brain will come outside? So that will cause the compromise for the brain stem and the other posterior part that will move out from that foramen. So that's caused the injury to the brain. That means deformity and compression towards the brain. And that is causing injury to the brain. That is very dangerous. It's mostly when the ICP raises above 20. And that is very dangerous. So all these factors, all this cycle that happens is for the maintaining the constant inside the cranial cavity. But because this, we see uh, that uh, by increasing this, uh, decreasing other things, that is uh, deforming the brain and that is very dangerous. So now let's learn some clinical points about the head injury. For the diagnosis, this is mostly clinical. And we do most of the clinical uh, monitoring for the patient. Uh, the first of all is the uh, pupillary reflex. 
and next one is the GCS scoring. For the consciousness, GCS is the blood sugar coma scale for the level consciousness level of the patient. And by this, uh, most important thing we do is there is a ICP monitoring. This is the most important thing in the management part also and in the diagnosis part also. So for the finally for the management, first of all we do the basic recitation, basic ATC part, airway breathing circulation. Next we do is to manage about the raised ICP and by monitoring the ICP, ICP monitoring also. There is a chance of seizures also, so we will manage for the seizures also. And if still the ICP is not maintaining, we cannot maintain the ICP, so we have to do the surgical management and we have to decrease the ICP by opening the cranium. That is, we do the shunt. Surgical management of raised ICP. So that is the final whole basic key point summary about the head injury. Thank you.